My name is Andrew Weaver. I'm a Canada Research Chair in Climate Modeling and Analysis at the University of Victoria. The tar sands are a very interesting example of end-to-end -end environmental degradation. Whether it be excess uh, use of water, whether it be toxic sludge that's out there affecting uh, ecosystems, or whether it be greenhouse gas emissions. So my particular area of interest in terms of tar sands exploration is what are you going to do with the emissions that arise from it? Tar sands production is going to quadruple over the next 20 years or so. Quadrupling of production of oil, even if you're sequestering emissions in the process of getting that oil, you still got that oil that you're going to burn anyway. And frankly, this is what, what bothers me most is 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to look back on our generation and say, why on earth were you burning that oil? Look at all these wonderful applications we have today for that oil that you burnt. I mean, look at the wind, look at the tides, look at the waves. Why weren't you using that energy? We're burning it. And as we're doing that, we're putting in emissions into the atmosphere that will be around for many, many, many hundreds of years and affect the climate worldwide over much longer than that. And the analogy I always draw here is, is put a pot of water on a stove and turn the element up to nine. Well, what happens is the water doesn't boil right away. It takes some time. Let's suppose you realize that halfway along that, oh my goodness, the water's going to boil. I'm going to turn it down to eight. Well, guess what? The water still boils eventually. So let's suppose, you know, as it's getting hotter and hotter, you turn it down to seven. And you think I've solved the problem. Well, you haven't solved the problem. Water's still going to boil. The only way it doesn't is you turn it right off. And now take that pot off the stove. It doesn't cool right away. It takes a long time for that heat to be lost. And it's a very similar analogy with the global warming is that the oceans are the water in that pot. The oceans are slowly warming up, bit by bit by bit. Even if we stop emitting greenhouse gases and maintain the fixed levels that we have today, that's the pot on the stove with number seven instead of number, number nine, it's still going to warm. It's going to warm by about as much as already has happened in the last 150 years. So that's going to take us to a condition which has no ice in the summer in the Arctic, no matter what policy paths we, deal, we do today. You can take that one step further, between about 9 and 25 percent of all species on this planet are likely committed to extinction already because of the fact that we're going to warm by about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 degrees more anyway as we try to equilibrate to those greenhouse gases here that exist today. We have to ask the question, what about future generations? And for me, fundamentally, this is the reason why we need to, to operate in a far more sustainable economic coupled with environment way in that future generations have the right, I believe personally, to enjoy the same benefits we have as modern society and it behooves us to actually protect it for their enjoyment down the road. There's a natural human resistance to not want change. People like to do what they've been doing yesterday. With the young people of today, I, I don't think, that, I think that it's, it's pretty clear that they want us to do differently. But unfortunately, most of the de decision makers in power, in, in corporations around the world, are my age or older. That is, you know, we're set in our ways. We've got our, our mortgage, we've got our two kids, we've got our 1.2 cars, or whatever we've got. And we've got a comfortable lifestyle, and we don't want to perturb it. But if you look to the generation after us, they're willing to change, they want the change. And they're going to look at us and say, heck, you're stopping this change. 